You should be saving for the future, but savings accounts suck, and investing can be scary. We combine the ease of savings with the real returns of investing. We call it Save Vesting, and it's only available in our new app, Stairs. Stairs offers 4 to 6% returns, no fees, and you can withdraw anytime. Do your future a favor. Visit stairsapp.com today. Some coffee's fast, but not fresh. Some coffee's fresh, but only after a long wait. Speedway coffee is made fresh at the push of a button, hot or iced, so you can have fresh coffee your way, right away. Find a store near you at speedway.com slash locations. Hey, and welcome to the HA Podcast. I'm Danny Sheriff, the host of this podcast, the founder of the HA Society, and an HA recovery coach who has walked wherever you currently are. This is the place to come if you care about getting your period regularly. This podcast aims to educate, inform, and keep you motivated on your period and HA recovery track. I would love it if you could rate and review this podcast, five stars only, to help make this podcast easier for other women with HA to find it. And last thing, nothing from this show should be taken as medical advice. Please seek the advice of your physician. We are hosting an event that you are invited to. My co-HA coach Ashley and I are inviting you to a free five-day workshop called Mental Hunger Mindset Mastery. What a name, I know, but it really sums up what the workshop does and is really well. A very common concern around HA recovery is, what if I can't hear my hunger cues? And there's a widespread fear of accidentally over or under eating for recovery because we don't understand our mental hunger or lack thereof hunger. And it's like mental hunger, what's that versus actual hunger and I think this whole confusion around real hunger and the hunger that's just in my head and should I be eating this much and all all of that jazz it just really needs to be consolidated we need to get on the same page with this we need to feel better about it and get a plan of action (laughs) so we're going to turn it all on its head in this workshop over the five days we're going to work with you to understand what mental hunger is and why we have it We're going to teach you to partner with it both during and after recovery for life. And we're going to give you the tools and strategies that you need to listen to your hunger during the different stages and phases of both recovery and your whole life. The workshop will go over five days starting November 12th and there'll be three live Zoom calls. Don't worry, there is a recording of every call if you miss one and there'll be assignments for you to tackle on the days in between the live calls. So register for this free workshop now by heading to thehasociety.com forward slash workshop or find the link in the show notes. That's thehasociety.com forward slash workshop. Can't wait to see you in the Mental Hunger Mindset Mastery Workshop. Hey guys, today's episode is a little different. I've had lots of requests from people about learning, being able to dive more into the in-depth side of cycle tracking and cycle health and of course as it pertains to HA recovery and once you have recovered. So I got the chance to meet Nora Pope who is a extremely experienced, extremely successful, has been in the game for many, 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 many years, practitioner of the Cretan model. So for those of you who don't know, fertility awareness tracking comes in all different shapes and sizes in the sense that there's different models. So I use the Justice model, you know, she uses the Cretan, there's the Marquette, there's different types. At their core, they're all looking at the same or similar uh, markers of progress or whatever, right? So like temperature, cervical mucus, they all look at those two things. And then there's just some slightly different rules or different charting methods within, but they're all good. It's about finding the one that works for you. In this conversation, we talk a lot about cycle tracking. We talk about the important biomarkers of cycle charting. Um, She uses interesting phrases that could be new to you, like red flow and white flow, and explains all of that and how it relates or correlates to HA and pituitary gland activity in general. And what 
would the chart look like with, for someone with HA? We talk about the timing of progesterone and estrogen blood tests in sync with your individual cycle. So if you're going to do blood tests, how you could be more uh, accurate with the timing of when you get them and so that they can be as valuable as possible. Important clinical uses for progesterone in amenorrhea patients. So we you know, hear a lot about people doing different challenges and taking HRT and that kind of thing. So we touch a bit on that and more. We talk a lot about it. And I wanted to give you guys a heads up because if cycle tracking isn't something you've ever done, you've ever heard of, this could be overwhelming. I mean, Nora really jumps in with a lot of information, maybe at a to the point that you might need some prior knowledge. So we do have an episode. I do have an episode already called Fertility Awareness Method for AJs and a blog post. So I'll put those in the show notes and you could totally get up to speed with that. But take a listen. Even if you don't fully know or absorb everything we're talking about, because it can be complicated, um, still have a listen so that you can absorb as much as you can and when you do get to a point where you're ready to chart whether you've recovered or not because you really can start tracking your cycle or your at least your cycle's progress on its way to its first ovulation and its first bleed you can find some really helpful information in this episode regardless so i hope that helps with context just a heads up that this is a long conversation with a lot of information And yeah, you can always come back and re-listen. Let me know what you think. And I will get to introducing the episode and introducing who Nora is a little bit more right now. So I'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, and welcome back to the Hypothalamic Amenorrhea podcast, the hardest, the longest podcast name to say on the internet. I'm so excited today to have Nora Pope. She's here because I'm in a course about fertility awareness tracking with Lisa Hendrickson Jacks and her and her colleague, Jessica Liu, she, they did an amazing presentation that I just, I wanted, I just asked her if she would please come on the show (laughs) to keep spreading the word that you guys on the show know that I talk a lot about cycle tracking, probably more than anyone else in the HA space does about cycle tracking even when you don't have a period and then how to use it as soon as you do. And I'm super passionate about it. So I think Nora might be more passionate about it. So it's, um, (laughs) it's really exciting to have her on the show and she is a retired neuropathic doctor and a Creighton model fertility care practitioner. So people won't know what that is yet probably, but we'll get to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And she has a private practice in Toronto Well, she had one, closed it down in 2019, and is the creator of the Cycle Charting, the Key to Fertility CE Seminars. Along with Dr. Jessica Liu, she is co-creating the 2021 Healthcare Professional Continuing Education Webinar, which is called Cycle Charting, Progesterone, HRT, and Fertility Enhancement. Nora is a highly sought-after public speaker, and since 2013, 2003, (laughs) we're still talking about 2003, has educated physicians, midwives, pharmacists, and health experts on the science or the scientific use of natural medicines. So we're very honored to have you here today as a highly sought after public speaker. Um, It was so cool that you said that you said yes. And she's been published in several journals, including the NDNR and Midwifery Today. So thank you. And fill in and there's more to you that is like such a high level uh overview so what else do people need to know about you I love to dance (laughs) (laughs) and um I love red wine my parents are Belgian so I have a joie de vivre I love naturopathic doctors and uh it's it's a profession I'm very passionate about and I, I closed my practice for one reason, because I want to focus on teaching, because I still feel there's still a lack of body literacy when it comes to cycle charting. And yeah. 
naturopathic doctors play such an important role at building bridges between um, natural medicine and mainstream medicine. And, and a, a growing number of naturopathic doctors across North America have prescribing rights, and they can prescribe things like bioidentical progesterone and antibiotics and low-dose naltrexone, and uh, in some jurisdictions, HCG. And these are really important um, you know, components of restoring fertility. Plus, naturopathic doctors are experts at drug-herb interactions, so we know how to enhance the efficacy of certain drugs, and then we know how to restore health with natural therapies, whether they be botanical medicines or supplements. So it's a profession I really love, and naturopathic doctors build bridges. So the course I've created with Dr. Jessica Liu, naturopathic doctor from Toronto, um, in our audience, we had midwives, we had pharmacists, we had medical doctors, we had naturopathic doctors, and we had physiotherapists, and I think I said pharmacists already. And um, we've recently been accredited with the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. So now every naturopathic doctor in the United States will get accredited um, if they take the course. They'll get six CE credits, including obstetrics and pharmacy. And I'm applying, we're applying for credits. Uh, for medical doctors and pharmacists and nurses and midwives as well. And we just haven't heard yet. So I'm a little frustrated. What's the date today? Today is June <laughs> 14th. Arr! So uh, if that's the case, and that course will be accredited for over a million healthcare practitioners, uh, and I'm being conservative, it's probably closer to two or three million. But um, we really want to get the word out to healthcare professionals who are interested in restoring health. And Samuel Hahnemann, the founder of homeopathy, said the physician's highest calling is to cure and it's to restore health. It's to make people who are unwell, well. And I want to keep that alive. So, so that's why I like cycle charting. It's just one of the tools. But Danny, if I may, what got you interested in cycle charting? Because I'm so impressed with what you've written about it. Could you tell our audience, dear, please, what got you interested in cycle charting? <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll bounce off each other. How's that? <laughs> I actually, yeah, I love it. I love it. I don't think I've really talked about that on the show. And I almost don't remember. I definitely was, um, I was trying to learn about HA and trying to understand why my period was missing and it would come up in my research, you know, like chart, charting your cycles or, or there would be podcasts that mostly talk about having cycles that would have like an episode about missing periods. And so it was always around in my research. And then I started to get a period. And because that seed was planted in just all of these different places, I'd heard it, mm -hmm. it made sense as a next step. And you also realize you're like, well, I definitely don't want to get on birth control. So I just, I know about this, but it wasn't until I was really, um, I had had a couple of my first cycles back after years of them missing mm -hmm. that I started to just kind of dive in and absorb all of the resources that I could and then realize mm -hmm. this is cool. Like this is really, really cool. I managed to get pregnant using it. Um, and I was so excited to kind of get pregnant on my first try because of it and it's just this it's wonderful tool and now I get to work with girls who are ha just having their first cycles and I get to help them assess their progress and and I get to help them diagnose issues and get them closer to recovery and everything because of it so yeah I kind of just stumbled into it because I didn't have a period at all well, I just hope, I hope you keep on writing because I think I love going on podcasts. I love being your guest, but writing is so important. So I, I, I would love to encourage you to write about your successes and it's every little bit will get the help, will help get the word out. And so um, oh. I'm just delighted to be here today. I really am. Thank you. Ah, so cool. <laughs> well, um, speaking of writing, you also provided a bunch of really cool topics to talk about today that I was like, great because these are better probably better questions than I would even know to ask yet so mm -hmm. I want to just dive in and just start talking about as many of them as we can I think sure. they're so interesting sure. the first one you wrote was about the important biomarkers of cycle charting like what red flow is white flow post peak phase how all of this correlates to the hypothalamic pituitary activity and 
like what would the chart show in patients with hypothalamic amenorrhea? So I I think that's a really great way to put it. And I okay. haven't spoken a lot about that on the show. What great. Do you got? So I'll, I'll start with um, sort of the textbook uh, chart. Cool. So I'd like to introduce the concept of rule of five. The rule of five are biomarkers you want to see. So you want to see five days of red flow. And I use the term red flow because I want to make women's health more media friendly. No one wants to talk about the period, the menses, even on TV commercials for sanitary pads and tampons. They don't talk about blood. They don't talk about the menses. Mm -hmm. It's like blue liquid. It just, you know, so I call it red flow because it's descriptive and, and it's, um, and actually it's a very important event and pregnancies are dated from the last menstrual period. I don't think that's precise. I think it should be done from your white flow days, but just to, it just to give you an indication of how important the period is. So we call it red flow and you want five days of red flow because what that indicates is that you had a healthy cycle. The previous cycle was healthy. You had optimum levels of progesterone and estrogen because the lining of the uterus had built up in such a way because progesterone and estrogen worked in concert and they had developed the nice lining. And because there was no pregnancy, the hormones drop. And so the shedding occurs and the white flow occurs. So you have five days. And then another biomarker you want to look for is five days of white flow. And I use the term white flow to be media friendly because, ooh, no one wants to hear about cervical mucus. It's so <laughs> yucky and gross. But more importantly, white flow is the concept it's the linchpin concept that we've trademarked called white flow makes babies. And we introduced that concept because it unites the two partners, the mother and the father, because men make white flow and ew, you can't talk about seminal fluid on TV and ew, you can't talk about cervical fluid, but you can talk about men and women making white flow. And that's where conception occurs is in white flow. And, um, when you're when you have rising blood estrogen, it's going to help grow one follicle. We have roughly two hundred thousand eggs, you know, in each ovary when we're born. But as we, you know, past puberty, one a month will grow, and it'll be the dominant follicle. And as it's growing, it's raising blood estrogen, and that risen blood estrogen will trigger the cervical crypts, the estrogen receptors in the cervix, to produce white flow. So. And that changes the, the woman's internal milieu because the vagina is naturally acidic. It's part of our immune system, and which is very protective. But for that window, that fertility window, for about five days, you want that healthy white flow, which is like seminal fluid, alkaline. It's not acidic. It's full of fructose. So it's very nutritious, it's full of minerals like potassium and zinc, which feed the sperm and can keep sperm alive in both the man's body and the woman's body. So when the couple have, you know, intercourse on days of the woman's white flow, um, conception will occur in that white flow because the woman's white flow is carrying the man's white flow up the vagina, up Mm -hmm. the cervix, up the uterus, all the way to the fallopian tube where conception occurs. And I find it very Jungian because Carl Jung loved the image of Jonah and the whale and, and sort of Jonah becomes human when he survives and emerges from the whale in the Old Testament tale. And we were conceived in a tunnel, a bit like a whale, and we're conceived in water and fluid, white flow. And we emerge, we tumble down the tube, we tumble down this cave, and we implant in the lining of the uterus. And but for about four or five days, we're in a tunnel. And the, the, the folds in the fallopian tubes or the salpinges are moving us along gently, conceived in water, then we implant in the nest. So I like to say that white flow is hatching the egg. And then the second half of the cycle, the egg is being planted in the nest. And if you have a healthy nest, then your next period will be five days. So those are big, the rule of five. And then, and then the rule of five applies after white flow ends, you want five to 15 days uh, before your next period. So I call that two to three days times five. Again, the rule of five. And those are, those are anchors to help you um, as you map out your cycle. They're like little signposts. And, and that's um, how we want to help develop body literacy. 
So if you're charting your cycle and you're seeing five days of red flow, then you're seeing five days of white flow after a few dry days, and then you're seeing 10 to 15 days before your next period, that's an indication you have healthy estrogen, healthy progesterone, and a healthy cycle. Now, what you're going to see in hypothalamic amenorrhea is not just the absence of menzies. That's, of course, the absence of red flow is very dramatic. But what else is going on? You mm -hmm. have dry days, dry days, dry days. One big, you, long, infertile stretches, window. Stretches, stretches of dry days. And what does that mean? You're, you have low hormones. You're low in estrogen. And then, oops, you'll have a couple of days and maybe the sticky and we call that 6PC in the, the Creighton model world, that sticky, pasty, cloudy, and then it goes away. And then dry days, dry days, dry days, dry days, and whoops, more 6PC. And then it might progress to like a 10K. So, you know, that's basically a clear and it's stretchy, about an inch, but it might lack lubrication. It's not, not as slippery. Slippery sensation when you're wiping is an indication of fructose and lots of water. And that's very healthy, nutritious white flow that will keep sperm alive. And then again, dry days, dry days, dry days. And this could go on for months. And that's the difference between someone with the classic rule of five healthy cycle with white flow and red flow and someone with hypothalamic amenorrhea. So it's not just the absence of red flow, it's the absence of white flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like a okay, couple things here. That, <laughs> that's what I was saying before when we started before we started recording, I said, you know, it wasn't that long ago that so many of us were just saying, I, I just don't have red flow. Like I don't have a period. So that's, that's right. it. But now we can say, well, I don't have a period and I'm starting to see some cervical mucus. So I don't have any red flow, but I'm starting to see some white flow. And you're usually going to see that first. Um, so it's really cool. You mentioned 6P and these acronyms and the Creighton model. Real quick for us, what is the Creighton model? So I, I love the Creighton model. I'm trained as a Creighton model fertility care practitioner. And and then I'm also trained, I took the course at the um, Creighton, Creighton University accredited course, but it was taught by the St. Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska. And it was spearheaded by a man called Dr. Tom Hilgers his wife, Susan Hilgers, and two nurses. And they developed this system at Creighton University. So that's why it's called the Creighton model. And it's really, what I liked about the, the charting system is that you, you encourage your client to chart and use their own words for the first couple of weeks, the first three weeks. And then you're slowly teaching them a global standardized system that's numerical. And I like numbers. Um, and so it, it really, and then you can start scoring the, the value of these numbers and get, give a sort of scientific or, you know, really good parameters of what is healthy white flow and what is maybe limited white flow and what is optimal white flow and maybe where there's room for improvement. So six means it's, it's a quarter of an inch in height when you're doing the stretch test. So I'll back up a bit. The, the methodology is the acronym we use is SOFT, sensation, observation, finger test. So sensation is you're, how you're charting your cycles that you're making wiping observations every day. And these are real time wiping observations and you wipe, wipe, wipe all day. Like you're wiping before going swimming, after swimming, before urination, after urination, sorry, being graphic here, before bowel movement, after bowel movement, you're wiping. And I like to coach my clients in the beginning by saying infertility is your friend. Because when you really understand your dry days, like what does that feel like? Then it gives you context. So when the white flow appears, you can go, oh yeah, big difference. Because what you want to feel is the difference between a, the dry, draggy wiping observation and then the whoosh, the slippery, slidey, lubricative wiping. And then you know you're entering into the estrogen zone. And you know that the follicle is growing. You know that estrogen blood, is blood rising because the ovary is feeding the rest of the body with estrogen. And you know there's a change happening. And then the next step is after sensation, the wiping sensation, observation, you look. And is it shiny? Like sometimes you could be very fertile and it's like a, a thin layer of Vaseline. It's very shiny, and but you can't stretch it. it nothing comes off the paper but you're still, you're still fertile because, because it's an external observation. And so wiping is all done externally. Your ent entire body is slippery and full of fructose and that can keep sperm alive. It's not acidic. 
So when there's intercourse that occurs, the sperm don't get killed in minutes in the normally acidic vagina. Okay, sensation, observation. So you're looking and sometimes you'll see a discharge and then you do a finger test. So six PC is a quarter of an inch. It's pasty cloudy. And so then like stretch between your fingers. Yes, just about it's a quarter of an inch. And then so six PC and that's, um, that's sort of um, the first category. The next one is eight, which is about half an inch. And it'll probably progress. It'll be less pasty, less cloudy. It just might just eight C is very common. And then 10 CKL. That's sort of like 16 points because <laughs> you've got the stretch that's over an inch. You've got mm. some of the clarity, which is, you know, indication of sugar. It's very lubricative. So you put an L and, um, and there's, it's very slidey. And that's really the optimum day of fertility. And that correlates to rising estrogen. And it can correlate to what I call peak estrogen day. And the term is peak day. People think it's ovulation. It's not ovulation. It's peak estrogen day. Because what triggers ovulation is the abrupt fall in estrogen. And that fall in estrogen, you know, basically um, it starts, what it does, it starts stopping the follicle from growing. The drop in estrogen allows LH to rise, which will soften the follicle, turn it into like a yellow raisin. So the egg can hatch and there can be a rupture because there's histological changes in the shell of the follicle. It has become softer and mushier and a rupture can, can occur. And then, um, and as that um, ruptured follicle shrinks into a yellow raisin or like a yellow body, a corpus luteum, mm -hmm it's going to start cranking out progesterone and then your body's going to produce a very dry sensation again, very dry, maybe, you know, a cloudier, pastier mucus and that seals the cervix. And basically that's a Darwinian way of saying one baby at a time is going to survive mm. for this lady. She's not going to have two babies from two different people. No way. So just one baby anyway. And then, um, and then if that corpus luteum is healthy, you're going to have X number 10 to 15 days after that peak day before your next period. So um, that's, those are, and then the coding really helps. It just gives it context. I know a question on your mind is how long will recovery take me? And I know that because I get that question a lot and it's tough because the timeline can be really unknown and Look, I can't give you a magic answer that's 100% accurate, but what I can do is ask you a whole lot of questions to understand things like what your lifestyle is, where your mindset's at, what have you already tried, what are you willing to try and not willing to try, and a lot more questions like that to determine a general range that you could expect. So I created a quiz to help get that answer to you because I was asking these types of questions to girls all the time. So I thought I'd make a quiz and it's called how long might it take to get my period back? <laughs> the quiz. So once you go through it and you answer the questions, it will give you not just a time range, but a quick description of how you might be feeling to help you connect with that answer and see and make sure it, yes, like this fits, this feels good for me. And don't worry these ranges don't have to be set in stone at all. The goal is to allow you to look at the range that came based on your answers and decide, you know, do I want to do this or do I want to speed this up? So once you get your range, you'll also get a few emails from me that week with some important tips that are specific to you to help you work through some of the roadblocks that could be slowing you down and in turn speed up your recovery time frame. So take the quiz now. Just head to quiz.thehasociety.com or find the link in the show notes and let's do this. That's quiz.thasociety.com. And then I also trained as a um, natural family planning, um, you know, medical consultant auditor. And at the time, naturopathic doctors didn't have prescribing rights. So I was an auditor, but I did all the exams. And I loved it. It was, a, it was a deep dive into obstetrics and gynecology. And it uncovered very obscure reasons for why women uh, may have a premature delivery, miscarriage, 
what are some of the, the more hidden causes of infertility in men and women? And then what are some of the ethical low doses uh, interventions you can use that don't hyperstimulate um, the ovaries, but restore health? So I just, I love the course. And, um, and then I worked with medical doctors in Toronto. We would collaborate on getting couples pregnant together. And I just loved increasing the efficacy of certain drugs with certain, you know, botanicals and so forth. So, and then I decided I just want to teach this because it, I just want to get the word out. And like things like, you know, I went to a conference, a naturopathic conference, maybe three years ago for postpartum depression. You should consider, you know, serotonin reuptake inhibitors and antidepressants. And my heart sank. And I just said, no, you can think of progesterone. You know, progesterone is very good for postpartum depression. So we still have a long way to go. And that, that's why I'm very committed to teaching. And I'm glad that Dr. Jessica Liu has joined me on the, on the journey because it's very daunting at times, but it's fun. It's not yeah. boring. So. When, you, when you talk about, um, you know, how we have such a long way to go, question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a lot of the people who are getting fertility treatments and going for t fertility treatment centers and spending tens of thousands of dollars on these treatments, a lot of them don't need it. And I, it's I actually know. just, they, they may, cause some, you know, there are, I mean, even in the, the Creighton model world, you do need, you know, there, there is, there are a lot of good protocols in, with, like what I mean by protocols, like pharmaceutical support, but I don't think they need, the higher the higher doses i don't mm. think it's targeted and the main reason is that fertility clinics ignore white flow they feel they really compartmentalize fertility the the yeah. fertility is a good egg egg quality and a healthy sperm and that's rubbish that's rubbish um it's white flow that unites that really creates fertility you need a healthy sperm a healthy egg and white flow because also white flow is showing whether or not the, the body has follicular genesis going on. Is the follicle growing? Is it pumping out estrogen? Um, is there a viable cumulus oophorus that's housing the ova? Is it going to rupture? I mean, it's data rich. And so I coached, I used to coach my patients into timing their ultrasound series during their white flow days. Don't go in on cycle day nine. If your white flow mm -hmm. starts on day, cycle day six, go in on day six. And so that body literacy pervades in fertility clinics. It's very discouraging. And so by looking at the white flow, looking at the follicle, you can time the drugs more um, precisely. And I, I was stunned at the number of times where couples did get pregnant and they weren't getting progesterone and then a miscarriage would happen. So I yeah. don't know what's going on there. Um, I just mm -hmm. feel... They don't reflect, they don't respect white flow and red flow. And yeah. the chart is a, you know, a photograph of women's health and it's there and start with the chart, follow the chart. You can time everything, whether it's an ultrasound examination, drug therapy, injections, oral capsules, suppositories, botanicals, acupuncture, start with the chart and respect the woman's rhythm. And, um, that's what I'm trying to get out to help. Yeah. Process. You talked about timing drugs and we have obviously in this community, there's a lot of conversation around like, I'm, I'm going to take some progesterone and my doctor's giving me estrogen and I'm on letrozole at uh, lots of different things. Um, what, tell me about the timing of progesterone mm -hmm. and estrogen blood tests in mm -hmm. sync with a woman's cycle, because mm -hmm. I get questions all the time. Like, will yeah. you look at my chart? And I'm not a professional in interpreting charts, so I just can't do it. But I do know that timing it right is going to be very helpful for your results. What Absolutely. can you tell these ladies? I'm so glad. No, no, it's, this is critical. So again, um, it's easier to start doing a blood test after your peak day. And so in the Creighton world, we encourage uh, women to chart diligently and Wait, um, what's whether your, they're single what's or your, married, sorry. What's your peak, what's your peak day? Yes. So so the peak day is the last day of estrogen action. <laughs> so and what is estrogen action? Estrogen action is choosing that one follicle per month. It's a dominant follicle, and that follicle is going to grow. And the sheer growth of that follicle is going to slowly raise blood estrogen. The ovary has an artery and a vein. That vein is going to return that estrogen to the rest of the body through the lungs, 
boom, oxygenated and back all over the body. And then the cervix gets turned on because it has estrogen receptors. And as that, those receptors are turned on, then you produce that white flow. And um, peak type mucus or fertile mucus or fertile white flow is either clear, either stretchy, either lubricative. Doesn't have to be all three. And uh, for me, the most important, you know, sign is the, the slipperiness. That's why I like to tell people to wipe with their eyes closed and describe the experience, whether it's draggy or slippery. And then the last day of peak type mucus or peak type white flow is your peak day. And it's a retrospective observation because the next day is much, much drier. It's very different. So the day before is your peak day. So on peak plus seven, that is the true mid luteal time of your cycle. And that's when we teach people to start um, getting blood tests. So for progesterone and estrogen, because they work in concert uh, post-peak and they work in concert at maintaining the lining of the uterus and getting you ready for implantation and pregnancy. So, and that usually happens after two or three cycles of charting. And then what's going to happen is what I love about charting is that now the woman has a visual record of her cycle. And then she's going to see these patterns and the rule of five will start to emerge. So maybe in the first cycle, she had four days of white flow. The next one is six days. The next one is five, but she's noticing white flow action. And she's going to start feeling that middle of the month pain, bing, like the little pinch when the fall cold ruptures. Mm -hmm. So she's going to start being able to anticipate when to test for estrogen peak minus five, peak minus four, peak minus three, minus two, minus one. Because ideally, to see the rise and fall in hormones before ovulation and the rise and fall of hormones after ovulation, you, can, you want to do peak plus 1, plus 3, plus 5, plus 7, plus 9, plus 11. And you're going to see that crescendo, decrescendo in the hormones. And then you're going to learn, ah, first day of mucus, I'm going to go to the blood lab and get my blood tested every second day. And ideally, you, you want to achieve peak minus 5, minus three, minus one, and peak. And you want to see a crescendo, decrescendo in estrogen. And it's it's wonderful. And then in, and then also on those white flow days, that's when you want to do a follicular um, ultrasound series and uh, to, mm -hmm. to see the follicle grow, rupture, and then shrink. And you want to go at least one or two days after rupture to really see it shrink by 40%. Then you Can you know just request it. to request a, a series like that? Yes, well, that. The, the NAPRO doctors, the, the NAPRO is Natural Procreative Technology, which is, which is the obstetrics and gynecology course I took at Creighton University. Those doctors are trained in uh, timing, you know, the, the sort of timing the, the blood tests and doing a, a real proper hormonal profile. And they're they're growing in number all over the world. And they're and if you if you go to fertility care centers of America, um, like fertilitycare.org, and ask and click on find a medical consultant, they're all over, all over the United States, all over North America, and um, and in Australia too, and in Canada. So it's a it's a it's a growing number. It's a growing network. And then in turn, what I'm doing is I'm networking. So with my students, I have students all over North America who've taken my course in cycle charting and learned some of the protocols. I'm getting them connected with medical doctors so they can work together, um, you know, supplying the acupuncture and the herbs and the vitamins and the support. And, um, and then again, some naturopathic doctors can prescribe some of the medication uh, like progesterone and HCG and low dose naltrexone. So it's uh it's growing. It's growing. Slow and steady wins the race. I have to be patient. I have to be the tortoise, not the hare. You know. So. I know. Yeah. It's been a long process for you too. You've been talking about it. You said since the nineties. Yeah, 1994. I got exposed to cycle charting for the first time, and I remember when I started naturopathic school in the nineties. Uh, I was the only woman in the classroom who knew when she was fertile, when she wasn't fertile, and no mm, one really yeah. knew about cycle charting. And it wasn't that long ago. I mean, maybe it was just 25 years ago. I mean, that's not that long ago. But um, now there's an explosion. I mean, if I walked into a classroom at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, where I, where I graduated from, it'd be much higher than 1%. It'd be more than yeah. one woman. Very cool. <laughs> and, you know, there's so many tools that people can use, right? Because 
also want to address and, and maybe you can say speak to this but when you talk about like you in particular talk about charting it's almost like another language in some ways right it's so <laughs> fluent there's a lot of going on and I can guarantee you there's some people listening that are like um what like slow down so what do you say to people who like this is one of their early conversations about charting so I highly recommend every woman on the planet cycle chart and even girls, girls who start their periods at, you know, 12, 13, 14, I started my period at 15. I encourage you to chart your cycle and it's, um, you're wiping. So the first day of your period, you're wiping. And at the end of the day, um, uh, is it a heavy flow or a medium flow or a light flow? What color is it? Um, and you wrote about this, uh, Danny. So I like that. What mm-hmm. color is yeah. it? Is it brown? Is it red? Is it burgundy? Yeah. And um, chart that. And then because with your period, you, you can't tell if you have cervical fluid. It just, it, it just, it just it's too confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, you can really only start looking or feeling for cervical fluid when it becomes drier, like when the, when the period is light and very light. So by cycle day five or six, you're going to be a bit drier. And what do you feel when you're wiping from front to back? Is it dry? If that's the case, you put a green sticker on the, on the chart. So the bleeding is red stickers. Dry days are green stickers. And then uh, as your estrogen is going to start rising, you're going to start feeling some white flow. You're going to feel slippery. So great. Is it slippery? So that would be L for lubricative. That would be the code. And um, that's the sensation. Observation. Is there stretchy? Is it, um, is it quarter of an inch, half an inch? more than an inch, so it'd be six, eight, or 10. And is it opaque? Is it cloudy? Is it pasty? Like, um, what do you see? Like, like rubber cement? Oh, is it like flour and water? Or is it stretchy like egg whites? And you, you record all that and then keep wiping, keep wiping, keep wiping. And then boom, the next day is quite dry. Day before was your peak day. That was your estrogen peak day. And then you're still fertile. Um, from peak until and peak plus one plus two plus three because your cervix is still open the serve even though um estrogen is finished the follicle has stopped growing the nature is generous so the the ova has been released it's kept alive for about 24 hours it's bathed in flow in the ovary and in the fallopian tube there's lots of white flow there and um and then the cervix is still open and being open to conception. How's that? And then it closes at peak plus four. And then peak plus four onwards, you're wiping, you're probably still dry. And those are considered days of infertility, peak plus four onwards. So this is a wonderful tool to assess your health. And then also, I love it because it it creates body literacy. And so couples can really respect the woman's days of fertility and the days of infertility and choose whether or not to start a family or, or, you know, uh, on days of fertility or decide not that month and they can have sex on days of infertility and not get pregnant without the use of hormonal contraception. Mm-hmm. So it is a dialogue creating form of family planning. It brings couples closer together and it really respects white flow in men and women. And that's mm-hmm. really how we're conceived in white flow. Yeah. So I hope, I hope I slowed down there. I tried my best, Danny. Yeah. I, yeah. I just like want everyone to know that you don't have to get all of this information down and, and on, it's, it takes time to understand, right? Yeah. It takes a few cycles to get yeah. the hang of it. And it's a lot of information, but yeah. when you're doing it, once you know it, it's really quite simple. I, I don't, I don't know why it just sounds overwhelming to people in the beginning. The first, it's- the first 90 days. It takes, it, it, give yourself 90 days. It takes time. I, I'm glad I, I worked with a fertility care practitioner. So mm-hmm. I worked with a cycle charting professional like Lisa Henderson Jacks. You mentioned her. And I highly recommend you hire someone. Uh, for me, it was a great investment. And then I knew I had body literacy. It was very liberating. I knew exactly what was going on in my body. It was very, very, you know, gratifying. So I'm glad I did it. Yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> okay. Um, Continuing to talk a little bit about like the progesterone and the estrogen and that important clinical uses for progesterone, BHRT, in amenorrhea patients. What what is the important clinical uses for it? So you you basically you start with the chart. So you're cycle charting, um, whether it's Billings or Justice or Creighton model, and you you want to identify the number of days of red flow, 
the number of days of white flow, and then you want to time your blood tests on peak plus seven, or if you have the resources, peak plus one, plus three, plus five, plus seven, plus nine, and 11. And then there, you're going to know if you have the right number, right amount of progesterone or not. And that's where progesterone HRT can be one of the tools to help you restore your fertility. It's um, another medication to think of is HCG. HCG is very interesting because if you don't have that much white flow, you're not going to have um, optimum progesterone because a small follicle it leads to small amounts of white flow. It, it, show, it shows low estrogen. And then in turn, you're going to have low amounts of progesterone. They're correlated. So I mentioned HCG because HCG is given strategically in the cycle. And what it does is that it helps um, stimulate the follicle to produce more estrogen. And in turn, that will uh, assist in the production of progesterone. Because HCG is sort of another pregnancy biomarker. And when you're pregnant, HCG helps the corpus luteum produce progesterone throughout pregnancy. So if you take it with a, with a woman struggling with fertility, you're like mimicking almost a pregnancy state. So you're going to grow the follicle. And you're going to support uh, progesterone production. Do people get do people get nauseous because don't they say that the pre, uh, morning sickness comes from the HCG growth, or is it such a small dose? It just it is. It's it's meant to basically it's meant to um, mimic help you optimize ovulation. So mm-hmm. we're talking at ovulatory levels in the yeah. blood, and yeah. um, and then post peak levels in the blood. But it's it's meant to trick the body into um, acting like the, the two important gonadotropins, FSH and LH. So follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So it's meant to nudge the cycle along. The, 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 the abbreviation is FELP, F-E-L-P. That's your cycle. So F is follicle stimulating hormone, which stimulates the follicles. E is estrogen as a result of a growing follicle. And then estrogen drops, you have L, LH. And then with LH, luteinizing or yellowing hormone, mm-hmm. you make the corpus luteum for P, progesterone, FELP. And HCG is implicated in all four. So it's a, it's a nifty drug. And um, I actually, I teach, we, Dr. Jessica Lou and I have a course about that. And we teach the strategic dosing, the you know, and the minimum dose required and how to time it. And so absolutely, for someone who has irregular periods or hypothalamic amenorrhea, um, you're just low in hormones. And, and as you can imagine, if you're low in hormones, um, you're going to have, you know, even if you don't want to start a family, I don't have children, but I'm glad I had healthy hormones because that means I have healthy bones. It means I have a healthy immune system. It means I have healthy, healthy heart has, I hope I have a healthy brain, but it helps my brain too. So, and, and it really, the hormones from top to bottom is a synergistic, um, component of our health. And so that's another reason why I like cycle charting. I see a lot of women with autoimmune conditions too in my, in my practice too. Yeah. And so um, absolutely. Um, the first thing you want to really monitor is progesterone. And then you, you sort of, you know, take the next step from there. Mm. It's an interesting take because obviously, well, I don't know about if it's obvious, but a lot of what we talk about on this show is recovering our cycle through increasing food intake, decreasing exercise, decreasing stress, and kind of like reopening our whole life and lifestyle mm-hmm. up to a, a new wonderful world of not being so type A, to be perfectly <laughs> frank. Um, do you think that these types of treatments are very important to pair in conjunction with that? Like, so what you're mentioning, uh, well, sure, you have to look at the whole person. Absolutely, you look at the whole person. Right. Um, no, I remember, I remember, um, no, I, you, you need laughter in your life. I think, you know, with exercise, you mean, I think it's getting outside that's really important. So getting out in the sun, very, very important, because vitamin D is a pro-hormone that can help with hormone balance. But no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, many athletes will lose their periods, and so you want you want to achieve balance. Um, I think though why why I spend so much time in my career on cycle charting is that it gives you really want the precise numbers and then you want ethical doses 
that really are in sync with the woman's natural physiology and natural cycle. Yeah. That's why I'm yeah. so passionate about it. Yeah, cool. Um, and you talk about ethical low dose pharmaceutical agents mm -hmm. to sync with the woman's cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, what does that mean? What are these low dose pharmaceutical the, agents? The, the point, they're a fraction. Some clinics go much higher. I mean, you know, like let's say Clomid. Clomid is a very mm -hmm. important drug. Um, a lot of clinics will jump into 50 milligrams a day. And in the, um, the Creighton model world, they'll start at a lower dose at half the dose. And they'll, they'll time it slightly differently um, based on uh, white flow. And so it's, it's in sync with the individual woman and um, it's a lower dose. And so you don't, you don't run the risk of hyperstimulating the ovaries. Um, but and also- So they're trying to time it with, with cervical mucus or white flow. Mm -hmm to just like increase increase the efficacy of it and to be it, that's the best time like your yes. body's already preparing yes. okay yes. so you don't want to fight the physiology uh you want to work with the physiology right and then low dose naltrexone uh, naltrexone is is used for drug addicts and well, more more actually more alcoholics because mm. that's uh it's trying to block um the uh, opioid receptors in the brain which in turn um can help optimize endorphins because if you if you optimize your endorphins you feel well and you probably have less cravings well endorphins are very implicated in fertility it's so it's so interesting there are endorphin receptors on the ovary but so by using one tenth of the dose that you would use for uh, an alcoholic you can help restore fertility um uh, with low dose naltrexone in both men and women, actually, it's fairly interesting because it's so it's so multifaceted, but it has a uh, immune modulating effect, and um, so so that's another example where you have an ethical dose. You're not you're not interfering with the, the the person's addiction centers or opioid receptors. You're 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 dealing with their endorphin deficiency uh, with low dose naltrexone. Um, so I find that just just very very exciting. And then there are there are times where steroids can be very very helpful. If someone has no periods or no mucus, meaning no white flow, sometimes steroids can just calm down the adrenal glands ever so slightly. And then those adrenal glands aren't producing androgens, and then the woman's estrogen has a chance to rise to the surface, and then white flow will appear. So, and you just may need one dose, one just one mm -hmm. cycle of steroids. So again, minimum dose is is a restorative worldview where you don't want to get the woman dependent on anything. You want to restore her cycle. And then you can, it's quite amazing how these very targeted interventions can uh, cure. Oh, that's right. That's the physician's highest calling. That's why we're here. So, <laughs> Well, yeah. And it makes me, makes me think, I feel like every, every one of us almost has, has been given something, if not just a round of the progesterone challenge through to, you know, a couple cycles of all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. How do you know? It sounds like, of course, we could go to fertilitykit.org and find like a, a trusted person. And, mm -hmm. and that's like a really great place to start. Mm -hmm. How can we know that our practitioner like knows this stuff? And how mm -hmm. can we advocate to, to say, hey, I, I want the timing of this to be in sync with like working with my body. And I want to make sure mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, the lowest dose possible. Like how, because I feel like that's so out of people's control sometimes. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, education is key. I'm glad I got the extra training I did, but there were cases where I was dealing with patients who had no fertility care doctors, like no NAPRO doctors in their, in their area. And I had to develop a relationship with them. And they were very amenable to getting the extra blood work done and timing the ultrasounds. And um, and they were open to certain medications just by by explaining and explaining the rationale and the mode of action and um, the, the positive sequelae of taking certain medications. So, um, you know, the, the world is changing, but there is a growing number of, of doctors out there and, and nurses and midwives who are interested and pharmacists who are interested in restoring health. So they're all over North in Canada. There's fertilitycarecanada.org and it's run by Maria Bezecchi and she's very skilled. She's a pharmacist and she really knows what she's doing. And mm -hmm. in, um, in the United States, you know, fertility care centers of America, they're, 
they know what they're doing. So I trust these healthcare professionals. And then my students, um, our website is fertilityce.com. And we have about, you know, 300 naturopathic doctors that we've trained and the numbers are growing. So, and um, mm-hmm. soon, you know, we're, we're, we're going to keep promoting this program until people are sick of hearing from us. <laughs> yeah. We love um, naturopathic doctors here as well. And it's mm-hmm. always like, can you get yourself with, you know, this type of a practitioner mm-hmm. who understands this stuff and mm-hmm. isn't just going to like mm-hmm. see you for five minutes and give you the pill, but like actually understands what's going on here. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that I think that's one of the biggest takeaways here is like learn education, 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 learn your cycle, work with someone who is going to advocate and knows more than you know about your cycles and you know, you'll be in good hands. And that's kind of the most important thing. And even when you don't have a period yet, mm-hmm. you need to have those people on your team. A lot of us are waiting. Like I'm going to mm-hmm. wait till I have my period back and, and that's okay. But I, I do think it slows people's progress down because, you know, mm-hmm. we're not super accountable to ourselves and mm-hmm. all kinds of, all kinds of reasons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I had but one. The good news oh. is, if you have classic hypothalamic amenorrhea, uh, the protocols are very, very effective. It's just you want to mm-hmm. you want to time the medication very precisely um, in the cycle, and you want to use the the pulsatile administration of gonadotropin releasing hormones on typically on cycle day three through six, and then you want to introduce HCG inter, you know injections on peak plus three, peak plus five, peak plus seven, peak plus nine. And so again, it goes back to the cycle charting um, because what you want to do is you want to introduce that HCG post-peak really in sync um, with the rise and fall of estrogen and progesterone. And that's how you, you, you can restore health um, mm. in quite a few scenarios. There's Kalman syndrome where people don't have, when they've lost that sense of smell, you can restore fertility and help maintain a pregnancy. Um, with this pulsatile administration of these drugs, uh, pre-peak, and then HCG post-peak. So those are, those are you know, sort of anchors. And uh, yeah. so it, it, it's, there is a lot of hope. And then, of course, a lot of women who lose their period, there could, it could be because of PCOS or, like you say, stress or maybe autoimmune conditions. There are immune-modulating strategies out there that can help restore health too. So it's actually a quite... Um, um, positive scenario to be in if you have that hypothalamic amenorrhea you it's you can restore your health absolutely Uh, yeah that's one of the greatest things is people forget it's it's a natural naturally occurring process hypothalamic Mm -hmm. amenorrhea like it's your body's doing its job Mm -hmm. um in in this moment so we think we're broken and we have a disease that we need to fix no like actually your body's just shutting down this reproductive system because it doesn't have what it needs to produce the hormones that it needs and that's totally normal Mm -hmm. and completely reversible Mm -hmm. it's just gotta eat more (laughs) and 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 the cool thing about the chart is that like we can i won't harp on about it too much but we can also see like how likely is fertility treatment to work how likely is like the drug that you take to work because if you're temperatures are all super low or Mm -hmm. you're a total sawtooth or we're Mm -hmm. seeing like wild mucus patterns or no mucus like that Mm -hmm. helps paint a picture of how your interventions are going to go maybe you can save some money by like waiting till the appropriate time to to take these pharmaceuticals and to take the next step or if fertility ivf is what you want to do now you have you know a more definitive Mm piece a lot more information to Mm -hmm. to tell you that it's what you need and that kind of thing so Mm -hmm. yeah well thank you thank you so much for coming on the show i think this was really really fun for me um to nerd out on it there's a lot of people who are going to really appreciate the deep dive because i keep it very surface level um (laughs) so yeah I, i appreciate that so much is there anything else you wanted these women to hear or know about charting and you get, I'll put the links to um, fertilityce.com in the, in the show notes, but what else do they need to know? Where else can they go to learn more? Yeah, no, if, I mean, email us. If you want to know the name of a naturopathic doctor who's been trained in our, in our, in our course, 
please email us. And um, again, we, we know we have a big network. So we, we know we have a we, we know a growing number of healthcare professionals who are interested in this. And we just we just we want to get the word out. So mostly in North America and Australia, anywhere else? Yeah, no, they're they're fertility care practitioners all over the world. I mean, there are yeah. I mean I shouldn't say that. There, there are medical consultants all over the world. I mean, there's some in Asia and some in Europe and um, definitely in the UK, France, Poland, cool. quite a few countries, Belgium, uh, some in Africa. So it, it's it's global. And what's nice is that the, the codes on the chart are standardized. So you can you're basically the, the chart is international. And that's uh, that's very convenient. Yeah, it's kind of like math. (laughs) We all agree on it. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank Um, you, Dan. I can't thank you enough. I hope I did an okay job. You did (laughs) a great job. Great job. Nora Pope and Jessica Liu, thank you. And we're with fertilityce.com. Thank you so Mm -hmm. much. Yeah, links in the show notes, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening today, guys. Please subscribe to the podcast. And if you could head to iTunes specifically and leave a rating or review, that would help so much because it makes it easier for other people with HA who are Googling around to find the podcast really easily. So if you do that, you're doing a service to all of the women. Some coffee's fast, but not fresh. Some coffee is fresh, but only after a long wait. Speedway coffee is made fresh at the push of a button, hot or iced, so you can have fresh coffee your way, right away. Find a store near you at speedway.com slash locations. If you love hosting over the holidays, swap out your old HVAC filter with a Filtreat air filter. It can help clear away particles from all your holiday cooking. Look for Filtreat air filters at a retailer near you. Let's clear the air.